Well, thank you all for having us again. Uh, again, my name is Jay McGee, and I'm with Community Hospice over in Jacksonville. I don't know, in a lot of industries, I think you can commoditize a lot of industries uh, that we look at in public relations, a lot of the sexy industries, a lot of the widgets, a lot of the things that we, the, the items that we sell. Uh, in many ways, healthcare is, you cannot commoditize, you cannot package the features and benefits of healthcare, especially an aspect of healthcare that people rarely talk about and shy away from. And, it, uh, and that's really what I do day in and day out is promote the values and benefits of hospice care, end of life care for people with a terminal diagnosis of six months or less. It is, uh, it is one of those things that, you know, kind of one of the myths we talk about in hospice is, you, you don't really get it until you're there, until you're thrust into it and you don't know how to respond to it. You don't know how to, how to feel, you don't know how to think about it because your world has just tur been turned upside down because your loved one has a terminal diagnosis and has m days and months to live. And that's, uh, that's something that you know, we, I, I don't know how any, if any of you have had an experience with hospice, but you really, don't learn a lot about it until you need to. You don't shop for hospice until you're there, you come to the precipice, and then you have to, uh, you have to deal with it. You have to be there for your family. So a lot of what we do, storytelling is hospice. You have to show in a visual way, and a very visual way, what family members experience, what the, what the feeling is, what the discussion is, what the, you know, so you can relate to that that feeling that, okay, there is somebody there to guide me, to hold my hand, to take me through this who's been, who's been doing it. So we try to depict that a lot in, uh, in what I would call very traditional means of print and broadcast. We, uh, because our core demographic, our prospective patients who are seniors age 65 and older and their family caregivers, people we call women ages 35 to 64, we do reach out and we do try to build affinity for our brand and help normalize that feeling through a lot of the traditional means. Uh, some of the things you're seeing on the screen, thank you, JT. Uh, in Florida Times Union, we, uh, we do quite a bit with them in terms of long-term series. We had a three-part series in September of last year uh, following a family who was experiencing uh, hospice from the very beginning uh, through the, to the later stages to the dying process and what the family felt and what the patient was feeling and both of their responses. And taking them through that continuum to show them that yes, this is something that you can get through. Uh, we have some, uh, we, we've been doing quite a bit of education with their editorial boards in Jacksonville at the Times Union and some of the other publications to help them understand and to understand how to position hospice within the healthcare continuum. We talk about from birth to natural death. Hospice is, you know, it's probably that one piece that People naturally just walk away from say, I'll deal with that when I need to. And we try to normalize it through them, through print. Uh, and, okay, and broadcast as well. I don't think we included any of the video, which is okay, because it's probably way too long. And I think I've been given five minutes. So uh, we talked. two left. What's that now? You've got two left. I've got two, okay. <laughs> and so we've got basically two core audiences. We reach out to the consumer side, to the B to C, business to consumer, and then the B to B side, business to business. And a lot of what we do there, uh, physicians, off, physicians and healthcare providers who need to sign an order for hospice care, we do reach out to them. And a lot of the way we do that is through content marketing and uh, infographics are two of the ways that we primarily do that. I think we're all bombarded by messages these days, and any way we can make it a little bit simpler for them to digest what, uh, what the feeling is and, and what they should expect, if we can kind of put that into bite-sized chunks, I think we're doing them a better service at a time when they may not be able to read anything, think anything, because they're overridden with emotions. Uh, Touching Lives is a, an example of content marketing. I think many of you know about content marketing. It's kind of news you can use. It's instructive. It is, uh, it is beneficial. It is not marketing speak. It is helping you achieve something without ramming a marketing message down your throat that we are the best, the fastest, the greatest. So we do a lot of that, you know, kind of embedding of messages into how, how can you leave a legacy how can you choose a hospice provider? How can you be, how can you care for yourself as a caregiver? All of these issues are very palpable when it comes to our caregivers. They don't know, again, how to uh, approach this. Many of them have never been through it before. Uh, and infographics, again, uh, just, just kind of taking that complex idea and, and putting it into pictures in, uh, you know, in this particular uh, model, we're talking about patient-centric care. Everything is about the patient. 
and there's a community of supporters, of caregivers, of healthcare providers who support that person, and how do they do that? So put it in a very visual way. I don't know how many of us are visual learners, how many of us see infographics on Mashable or Instagram or, or Pinterest or wherever, but that's how I get all of my information and that's how I process. So I think we really are kind of catering to that, uh, to that audience and uh, we, do that, we do that to consumers to some extent, but really to the healthcare providers who only give us three seconds a day because hospice is 1% of their day and they like it that way. I think that's a good way for us to transition into the next facet of storytelling. Next up we have Aaron who's going to be talking to us a little bit more about uh, modern storytelling online and how different projects online have integrated ways to effectively tell stories through social media and through digital and all kinds of different scapes. Uh, good morning. Good morning. So I wanted to share just a couple of examples with you as we did talk about modern storytelling, but before we do that, I thought it'd be worthwhile to spend a few minutes talking about what happens with visual storytelling when you guys walk out of this classroom and you walk into the jobs that you're going to have every day. So while we all know the importance of visual storytelling, and there's a growing body of science that tells us how it affects people and how it causes them to engage, a lot of the clients that you'll come across, whether they're internal clients, if you're in an internal communication shop, or if you're in an agency and you're consulting to people, they're not gonna buy it when you first tell them. So the, you have to think about how you're going to effectively get people to do, to join you on this kind of journey of doing visual storytelling work. Uh, it's, it's inappropriate and it's naive, but you'll often hear people say, well, that's superfluous. Just give people the information. I don't need to make it look pretty. I have heard that I don't need to make it look pretty more times than I can tell you. And you have this moment of frustration where you want to shout, it's not just about making it look pretty. It's about making it better and it's about making it more effective. But you have to recognize that there's a, an, an opportunity there in that moment for you to educate your client and talk to them about the power of visual storytelling. So this is an example that I've actually used. So I'm, as, as um, JT said, I'm currently at the Gordon and Benny Moore Foundation. So I joined them to start a communications department, which meant they hadn't really done a lot of communications work before. So I've had lots of these educational opportunities, we shall call them. Uh, so the, one of which was uh, rebuilding our website. Now, these are smart people. We're talking Nobel Prize winning smart people that I work with, brilliant, brilliant people. And they're sure that since they're inspired by the information, that if they just give this information to other people, they're going to be equally excited about it. So they didn't really see much need for visual storytelling. So one of the examples that we gave them is, thank you. Um, I had a few folks look at this site. So this site is called Project Imagination. It actually has nothing to do specifically with the public relations field, but it's great examples of visual storytelling. It's a project that Ron Howard and a handful of other filmmakers created where, long story short, they have this number of different photos that are available and challenge people to develop a story based on what it is that they see in the photo and what does that mean to them. And there's one, would you curse her down a little bit? There, right there, this one right here. So they looked at this photo and the person who took it said, this was taken on the streets in New Orleans, and the person who took it said, I don't know who this person was in this little electric wheelchair, but they were going somewhere with purpose. There was something that they really wanted to do and they really wanted to accomplish, and I think that there's a story there. So this is one of the examples I used with them in talking about why we needed to visually bring the stories to life for what it is that they're trying to do. Because while their entry point might be very different and really nuanced because of a deep understanding of a patient care issue or a scientific issue, that's not the case for a lot of the audiences, particularly when you're talking about a layperson's audience like what would come to a website. So after giving them a couple of examples like this, that's really pretty. <laughs> would you go over to the Moore Foundation one? I'd actually kind of like to play on this one right Sorry. now. Because I look at the Moore Foundation one more than I do this, as you would imagine. Um, took us to this place that we were able to retool this website, and as a result, a lot of the other complementing materials that we use to communicate the Moore Foundation brand and the specific programs that we work with. So as you see on this, and lovely, lovely worker there doing the curse ring, JT, thank you. Um, so part of what we wanted to convey is um, the Gordon, so Gordon's one of the founders of Intel, and he and his wife endowed the foundation about 12 years ago. And the three major areas that we fund in are patient care, environmental conservation, and basic scientific research. I was telling a few folks last night, science is because Gordon's one of the founders of Silicon Valley, and that's his thing. 
We funded environmental conservation. In fact, we're the biggest funder of environmental conservation work in the country, and it's because Gordon likes to fish. This is what happens when you work for a family foundation. And we do patient care work because they, like many of us, have had challenging experiences in the patient care environment, and they said, we have the means to try to make a difference here. I'm sure lots of other families experience what we do. So there's stories behind the decisions that they made to fund in each of these areas. But it used to be that they would just kind of have a list. This is what we fund in. People don't really need to know too much about it. And we had a real opportunity to visually tell the story. So would you cursor over just one of the boxes? So we came up with a couple of different visual cues where we have iconography that actually carries throughout the site and throughout all of the other materials, as well as the iconic images that we use. And the idea of the iconic imagery carries through the entire site so that there's an image associated with every single grant that we've given, which is tens of thousands of them, and there's an image associated with each program so that we can convey why it's important to us to fund in the Andes Amazon region and what we're trying to do in protecting forest cover there, for example. So I take that through, one, just because it's a recent example I have of kind of how you have to sell it in to people, and two, to show that there's a lot of beauty in the simplicity of visual storytelling, too. I love a good infographic, too, so much that my last staff actually made one about me because I talked about them so much. Uh, but I think that sometimes, yeah, I didn't bring that with me. But, uh, but I do think that there's a lot of beauty in the simplicity of visual storytelling. And then when you have folks that you're working with, you'll find that sometimes starting at that simplest place is the easiest way to draw them in and get them to buy into the value and importance of visual storytelling. So I'll stop there. Perfect. And then finally to transition into what Ron is here to talk to us about, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the convergence of different ways of how we tell media, the different mediums that we use within media to effectively tell those stories. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to be here. It's great to be a Florida Gator. And uh, while the football team may not be having a championship season, I would submit that the College of Journalism has a championship season every year. So it's great to be here. Yeah, buddy. All right. Uh, if, you, if you look at a 50-year history line, uh, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And uh, everybody, probably including you, has seen a clip of the Abraham Zapruder film. Imagine, God forbid, that, that an event like that was taking place today. Can you imagine how many different clips there would be from how many different angles and maybe would have figured out whether uh, Oswald acted alone? But just as uh, uh, every organization today has a website, and maybe 10 years ago some still did not have one, so too do they also have a hard piece of collateral material about who they are and what they do. Why? Because they are trying to make sure that their audience, or their many audiences, can be reached with content that the audience wants, but consuming it in a way the audience wants. So for some people, that's cruising your website. For some people, it's a leave behind piece. If you over rely on any one platform, you're making a decision by indecision to shut out part of your potential audience. So while you guys are the fighter pilots of the new technology, and you are basically supposed to be the masters of these major communications platforms that have the highest level of connectivity in human history, part of my message to you through this presentation today is to beware, to be cautious that you don't become enslaved to it and over rely on it to the point that you lose the ability to look someone in the eye and have a conversation because nothing telegraphs a visual message better than a face-to-face -face conversation. Not a tweet, not a video clip, nothing than the three-dimensional image of you interacting with someone else. So that's my kind of message at the end, at the beginning, because I think it's the most important thing for you to know as you launch your lives and your careers. These platforms are critically important, but it used to be graduates from this college went out and became the masters in journalism and public relations, being the professionals. With these tools today, Everybody is a reporter, everybody is an editor, everybody is a publisher, and everybody is a producer, even without any particular skill set except knowing how to use these devices. The danger there is that we are all now content creators and content consumers, but there's a lot of crap out there, all right? And it lives in the cloud. Your parents probably have a box in the garage of some of the things you did growing up in school, ribbons, trophies, essays you wrote, well, you have created a box, we all have created a box of our own that lives in the cloud, and that stuff lives forever. And it's good, it's bad, it's ugly. The goal here is, in your professional work and in your personal lives, to use these tools to the maximum benefit for communications. And I would say to you, 
that the challenge for me and my company with my staff, including a lot of young professionals, is figuring out how best to do that to represent our clients, our projects, whether it's a pro bono, not-for-profit, or a statewide campaign on preventing sexual abuse of children. You've got a message to people in meaningful ways where they can get it and they can consume it in ways that matter. So we've created, um, since the attention span of everyone is so brief today, what used to be a half-hour television show with a top political leader, we've created a program called Newsmakers, where we interview a, a top leader. Now, we can generate press for when I'm interviewing the governor or the attorney general of Florida or the speaker of the state house or one of the agency heads, uh, Department of Corrections, Environmental Protection, and have a reporter cover that. But we also cover it ourselves. So we, we edit these into uh, five-minute pieces, basically, because that is the high end of attention span. And we post it you know, in a number of ways uh, so people can access it the way they want. We put out an HTML email. We put it on, on Facebook. We put it on YouTube. And we have newspapers all over the state that subscribe to this service. We produce this program for free. We do not charge newspapers. And they now uh, carry our material. Isn't that amazing that they are carrying our video? Because frankly, most newspapers are trying to stay relevant. And while they have the instinct to try and produce video, they kind of suck at it. All right? because they don't have people who have television skills doing it. I think that's going to change and evolve. But the point is this convergence of, of online and, and traditional, where they converge is an opportunity to deepen your audience by sharing content to people, having them repurpose it. And so all of these interviews live in archives on multiple platforms. And you know, we believe it's the way of the future, but we're actually revisiting how we do this. And we're probably going to cut these five-minute shows into brief sound bites so that somebody who just wants to access one on a specific subject with a subhead can do that. But um, all of this is very exciting, but I'm going to say to you chronically throughout this uh, presentation to beware and be careful. And uh, at the end, I'm going to challenge you all to write a longhand letter to someone you love like a parent. It will freak them out, but they will <laughs> love it. Well, thank you, Ron, for that. And scroll through the end of this. Now we're going to open up the floor to any questions that you guys, and my job here is to help facilitate the conversation between both of you and our panelists. Feel free to tweet in any questions or go ahead and raise your hand and ask aloud. Everyone's here to help you guys with anything that you have questions on or wonder about, so we'll start off with Ms. Adar over there. <laughs> um, do you think that there's, you know, you all work for very different types of businesses. Do you think that there's a specific fit for as far as like what type of storytelling you do for the business or do you think as Ron said it's important to use different platforms for every business? Well I, I would just say to you that I, I you know going back to my days in the old newspaper business or the old television business television has to have the pictures you know we used to have a rule that no talking heads if you go to cover a meeting God forbid you come back with just video of a talking head or a crowd scene so what is the picture that defines that story so when someone sees it immediately, the same thing with a, with a, a freeze frame or a, a still picture, what is the sound bite? What is the quote that's going to define that moment, that meeting? And so I think we're all challenged, and, and Twitter I think actually helps with that, to write effectively by making the maximum use of every word and every image so you're not wasting time of the audience or yourself. And I can say with hospice, it's really taking the immersion, you know, immersing yourself into that family uh, crisis, that emergency, that, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And really, I think you, you say video will get you there, but I think pictures, still pictures are a little more powerful, honestly. Uh, and I think we, when we pulled our, uh, you know, our constituents, I think we, we do use photos, still photos, a little bit more than video, <coughs> partially because we are not Instagramming, we're not vining, we're not doing some of the cutting edge social media because that's not our audience. Our audience are women who are heads of household who are taking care of kids and they're part of the sandwich, sandwich generation. They've got young children and they've taken care of their aging parents. They don't have time to explore some of these emerging social trends. We have to understand them and be ready for them. But in many cases, we just want to implant in them the idea that this is, nor this is normal and we'll help you get through it. So really, it's that, you know, embedding that reporter like we you would do in the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars and the Gulf War, you know, putting them in there and, fe and feeling it and, tr and, trans and transmitting that feeling so that you can say, okay, I'm ready. 
I've got, I've, my loved one needs this. And from my perspective, it's all about the audience. You know, so I tell people all the time, don't fall in love with any one kind of channel or any one medium because it's going to change. You know, so today it's, you know, it, well, depending on the audience, today it's Facebook for some. Facebook is yesterday for others. Um, you know, we had newspapers. They've changed a lot. We have TV. They've changed a lot. There used to be stone tablets, you know, so <laughs> it's changed a lot, and it's always going to continue to do so. So paying attention to where the audience that you're trying to reach consumes their information and what what kind of information and how it's delivered causes them to act and behave and, and react in the way that you want them to, that's what drives it. You know, if, you, if you're just an infographic person, then your job is to sell infographics, and you're going to end up forcing them into situations where they don't work. Uh, so I think, as Jay said, being open to and learning all the different tools that are at our disposal is the way to go so that you can always do that optimal match with your audience. Um, in regards to storytelling, what if you come to a situation that you have this really, I guess, it's, it's a very like sensitive story that you like to tell, like if somebody dies <coughs> or somebody, you know, that, that their story <coughs> lives on after their death, but you need to figure out who to talk to and who to get that one quote and who to get that one message you want to portray. How do you come about finding out? the persons that you're going to talk to, and how do you come about developing that story that's very sensitive to an audience? Anyone I think that's yours. Yeah, yeah, that really yeah. is. Well, and, and, and legality, and, and sense of legality, that is, uh, that is tricky, because obviously we are governed by HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act of 1996, and you know, if you work in healthcare, you're, you are very conversant in understanding of HIPAA and what you can and can't do and how you can approach families with, and, and, you know, their, their PHI personal health information is what they have to basically give you the right to use. So it is sensitive. We're actually going through a policy and procedure right now at my work to develop a means and a process to approach families to share their stories because there's that whole, there are, are the social workers who work with us are very sensitive to that we do no harm with our families and they feel that if we're using them in a marketing sense to tell a story that that's taking advantage of their situation and if they refuse to tell their story we may not provide the optimal care we may you know not give them what they deserve on the flip side i say you only learn about what we do through other people's stories you can't sell it in a traditional sense like you could sell uh, you know, Fig Newtons at the end cap of, at Publix. You, you can't do it that way. You, you have to get in there. You have to burrow into that, that, that grandson's mind and say, why did I do this? And how, how much more glad am I that I'm doing this? And uh, that I, I wish we had called them sooner. I can't tell you the number of times I wish we had called them sooner. So it's a, it's a slippery slope. It's tricky. Uh, we, we have our patient managers who get to know the families, and then they have a pretty good idea of, of who's open. If there's a family in crisis, obviously, uh, we don't do that. But a family who's got somebody who's relatively, you know, they, we say six months or less, most of our patients come to us within a week, and they're gone within three days. So you have to be very, very, uh, very aware of the dynamics within that family, and it's not easy, and we don't do it a whole lot. <coughs> But we, when we do, it's, uh, you know, we do those three-part series. We work with the print media. We work with, uh, you know, we, we, we want to tell the whole story. If we're there, we want to really get in, and the, our families are on board with us. And we go to the nth degree to make sure of that. And I would add to what Jay said, too, in that absolutely respecting the laws um, and the sensitive nature of the stories. But a lot of patients, in particular, that I've worked with over the years find telling their story or having a family member tell their story become part of the healing process, mm -hmm. um, particularly yes. with lung cancer, uh, where people feel like they, they want to fight. Uh, because most lung cancer diagnoses come pretty late, and people know that there's not much you can do at that point. Uh, since most lung cancer is caused by smoking tobacco, they have a built-in enemy, and they want to fight. And part of that fight and that legacy that they then want to leave behind is making sure that it doesn't affect other people, family members or otherwise, in the same way. So I think there's, it's still important, obviously, to follow the rules and the laws. As Jay said, it's important to be respectful, but giving people the opportunity to share those stories in a way that is different depending upon the audience. Sometimes it's very nuanced. Um, sometimes it's really loud and ugly and in your face. And that's right for some audiences, too. But it's been, um, you can do that in a way that honors the person 
and is really, really authentic. I'm going to go back to my core message because what I got from your question was, what if you had to find out what was the, the thing, the legacy, or one of the legacies of someone who's passed? And I think it comes down to that, that human level of demonstrating your, your concern, your compassion, humanity. It's like the old newspaper days of an obituary writer having to call the family and make that very difficult request. I got hanged up on when I was an intern at the Miami Herald calling one of our editors whose daughter had died in a car accident. And uh, my editor said, call him again. And uh, you know, I'm 20 years old, this guy's hanging up on me. He's one of my bosses. The third time I called, he put his brother on and I, I got what I needed. So it's just about being calm, being compassionate, and not tweeting the request or, <laughs> or, or yeah. doing it in some way you would want it done with you. But everybody wants to remember it. And uh, Legacy.com, I think, is one of the coolest things that's been developed where anybody can add a comment about a past friend or, or relative. I'll go ahead and throw a question in there. Um, I know, Ron, you personally have to deal with a lot of clients and a lot of being part of a firm. You deal with people that aren't necessarily in-house. Are there any people that necessarily object to different kinds of media when telling a story? Are there a lot of traditionalists that don't want to hear that you're trying to use social media to tell this story, that you're trying to use a video? I, th I think uh, Jay and Aaron both made that point that uh, we're evolving the marketplace and the audience and we're educating them even as we're trying to lift them up and do a more effective job of selling their idea, their <coughs> issue, their product, their service, even for a not-for-profit. So, you know, it's the comfort level of the client and uh, sometimes you have to demonstrate the value of these new tools. I, I like to say, and I, I think it was reflected in, in both your comments, that uh, say it's a corporate entity that wants to sell the public on something. The best way to, to sell people is not to sell them, is to give away knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is with these new tools. People, survey show, will trust a corporate entity that selflessly gives away knowledge. It's actually a really smart way to sell, is to start off by not selling. Mm -hmm. right. Barbara. When it comes to doing press releases, like whether in-house or you've given it to the press or for an event, how do you compromise, like matching the format that the, you know, the media wants and your company wants? And still being true to that story that you're trying to tell and finding that element that really makes it stand out. Because I feel like sometimes, you, you know, you're forced to like do it in a certain way and they want it that way and a specific place and then you lose that flow that you're trying to convey. You know, a good story is a good story. You know, so if you can convey that in a lot of formats. So if there's nuance to exactly what the headline looks like or where they put a byline or if they put a byline, none of those things should really affect what your story is. Um, you know, there, there are some sort of safeguards that you can use that make it palatable for a wide array of audiences, like write it in AP style and chances are good that your uptake's better and it's gonna be a better fit for lots of different outlets and start from that point. But the construct of your story should be the same, whether you're delivering it in 140 characters or in a news release or in a video or in an infographic. You should have you know, a, a clear story that you're telling there uh, is there something specific about you, the format that you're talking about that you've seen? No, what I'm saying is when they want you to like fill it with stats or make it more quantifiable and then you're trying to convey maybe a more emotional appeal mm -hmm. to it and they want you to make it very, like not newsworthy, but just you know, show you put the numbers in there and you're trying to go for more an emotional yeah. appeal. Like, gotcha. The best story is always <laughs> a combination of the intellectual and the emotional. So you want to have both. Uh, because if you, if you don't have that combination, uh, you run the risk of having it just be soft and just be emotion and capture people's attention in the moment but potentially not stick as long in a way that they think that they can actually act on it. So you want to have that combination always. So, you know, I, I know that there are some folks particularly that would lean way more toward the intellectual, like I just want a lot of stats and I want a lot of data in here. But you can use those data as supporting, you know, elements to any kind of quote or story that you may have that's a bit more personal and a bit more emotional. And uh, I, I would... Uh, Add to that that, you know, uh, it's like when you do a, a term paper and you have to have all the footnotes in there. And you've got all these stats and you feel compelled to share them. Well, storytelling today is be a good judge, be a good editor, all right? Uh, you owe it to create the best content. So what's the most essential stat that helps amplify, magnify the message so people get it? Because you have to use better judgment than just listing a bunch of stats to go with the image. So which stat best underscores the image? If people want to drill deeper, they can get your deeper research. What would you say is the 
most difficult platform for you to get your false story out or whatever purpose it is you're trying to <coughs> do with like each individual audience? Like what platform is the most difficult? Would you say it's the online platforms or print forms now? I think because there's still a gatekeeper when it comes to traditional media, you know, we're, as Ron said earlier, you, you could, it's so easy for you to be your own publisher now to tell your own story in your, from your own point of view and to transmit that through your, to your audience, but you still have a gatekeeper who wants to create a story to, for, to, to cater to their audience, whether it be hard-nosed facts versus emotion versus whatever, they have an approach that they want for their audience and you don't control that. So I think still traditional media, you know, you still have to go through that gauntlet, so to speak. It comes down to just knowing your media, knowing having those relationships and understanding what they're looking for and, you know, kind of picking and choosing, I think. You know, I mean, you do have control when you're, uh, when you're on the PR side, but, uh, but yeah, traditional is for us. I, you know, you see, uh, you know, as a former news guy, I, I've been really amazed at what newspapers have tried to do to survive and even thrive. And I, I think a newspaper website in any market that I'm aware of is much better, kicks butt over the local television stations, plural, websites. They are still the medium of record, and they have transitioned to a point where it's all online content now. Someone uh, may still go down the driveway in their bathrobe to pick up the hard copy morning paper, but the news can be read online. You can read a, a million newspapers online, and they do it better than any television station. So that's a healthy sign. But to try and stay relevant and edgy, the Tampa Bay Times, which arguably is the best newspaper in Florida, if you follow politics and public affairs, one of the most uh, popular features is called The, bu uh, the Buzz, you know? Uh, and it's a blog about politics. And stories are now little tiny, you know, capsules uh, rather than, you know, 500, 600 word pieces. <laughs> And readers can enter comments at the end of any story. And what they did, to, because this was such a popular feature for people to add comments, I call it the Tanya Harding effect. They allowed people to basically take a hammer and kneecap a political figure, whoever is the subject of the story, with no responsibility at all, because you could do this anonymously. That's changed now, because the newspaper has a responsibility. But for years, they were letting people just go out there and hack up anybody. And people were reading it, and it was the most popular feature. I don't think it was a good day for journalism. I actually don't think anyone's any harder than the other. I think it depends on the day and the story. I mean, there are days where it would be easier for me to call a reporter and pitch a reporter than it is to talk a client into why we should use social media. <laughs> you know, so so it really depends on on which one. I agree with with Ron that I think some of the best things that we have out there right now are the sort of evolution of what's happened with newspapers. Because while I love the democratization of everyone being able to be a content creator, and from a public relations standpoint, it's incredibly attractive because you get a lot of message control initially. Uh, but the thing that is, I, I, the reason I agree with Ron on that point is that not everyone who's a content creator does the research and does the fact checking and backs it up. And they'll kind of just throw these bombs out there and let people react to them. I've had very well-known and well-respected bloggers say to me, it doesn't matter if I get it right because I can just update it later. I just want to see what people think when I put this out. And these are bloggers for the Washington Post. And so there are times when I hear things like that that I, you know, I hearken back to wanting a really good fact mm -hmm. checker and somebody who's going to bring that degree of credibility to the content that they're developing. We'll go this way. Okay. Um, Great. Yes, I agree with everything. Um, <laughs> something that I think we are challenged with, I work for a corporation at Florida Blue, and um, it's really important to have the research and the planning up front to have a bank of stories, right? So almost a database of stories or a story bank because when the crisis hits or the moment hits and you need the story, if you don't have that, then you gotta go, well now I gotta go find a story, right? And I gotta go find that grateful patient or I gotta go find the, the in my yeah. world, you know, the nonprofit that had a great outcome. And it's, you're rushing instead of having those things and keeping those constantly updated. So I haven't heard y'all say that and I'm sure y'all have that, but you know, I just think that's important because it's always the heat of the moment and it's like, wow, if we just had somebody to, you know, to have in the paper to react to the, bad news to have a good news, if you don't have that, you lose that opportunity. It, you know, I think you bring up a great point and uh, crisis management because uh, 
you know, while a corporation sleeps or a not-for-profit sleeps or some uh, politician sleeps, somebody on social media platforms could be hacking them close to public death. And, uh, and if they're not comfortable navigating the shoals of those platforms, then they are left defenseless. And there are a lot of people in the corporate world, clients, who kicking and screaming, why, why do we have to have a Facebook page? It seems so wrong. We're a sophisticated, dignified company. Because there, there are two reasons. First of all, to put out proactive, positive messages about yourself. And if you're not having somebody competent, like your generation, uh, navigating and monitoring, then you can be attacked um, wrongly. And, and if you have no defense up, no plan for a proactive response, then you are left bare in front of the marketplace, and you're being defined in the terms and turf of your adversaries. That's not a good thing. Yeah, well, I'll tell you one. We have a client. Uh, you could look this up. Uh, her name is Lauren Book. Uh, her dad is one of the most prominent attorneys and lobbyists in the state. And she started a foundation called Lauren's Kids. From the ages of 10 to the ages of 16, the nanny that her parents hired and, you know, background check, sexually abused her in their family home. Six years, uh, completely dominating her. And uh, she was afraid to come forward. She finally did. She's written a book about it called It's Okay to Tell. She started a whole foundation in this subject matter that used to be you couldn't even say what I've just said in a college classroom has now become a public service announcement series in the state of Florida, a 30-minute television special in the state of Florida. The state legislature funded $2 million to build curriculum tools, not for college kids or high school kids, for kindergartners to learn about how to prevent becoming a victim of child sex abuse. So I would say her story, uh, she's, she's beautiful, she's articulate. Uh, even hearing a sound bite with her or a long form interview with her or a live speech, uh, she's one of the most compelling storytellers I've ever heard. And on a very sensitive subject matter, she's made the world safer uh, because people are comfortable listening to her. And uh, we told a story last week, actually. Uh, palliative care is a new modality in end of life care, basically for people who aren't dying right now, but people who are, have a chronic illness. And we have one of our physicians who uh, was taking care of a firefighter paramedic who was in his early 30s. And he had always wanted to be a nurse. And he was studying to be a nurse and then he uh, came down with advanced cancer and was incapacitated for six months. And the only thing that mattered to him, other than his children and his estranged wife, was to be able to get that nursing degree. So, uh, and he was two or three credits away from getting that degree. So. Our doctor ended up working with St. Vincent's, the hospital in Jacksonville where he wanted to work, in uh, getting his honorary nursing degree signed off by the chief nursing officer and having uh, an award presented uh, to him at his bedside where he you know, couldn't move, but he was, uh, had probably 20, 30 of his best friends and buddies and family there to, uh, to honor his life. And a guy who had no plans to give up on life was uh, being honored in a way he deserved, but he hadn't been to that point because this illness had taken away so much of his uh, vigor and his, uh, you know, as a firefighter and paramedic, you're, you're the hero. You're the guy out there who's saving lives, and now here are these people honoring your life. So that's, I've been in this business for 12 years, and I think, you know, I, I make the analogy, you can make more money anywhere, uh, but this is, this is what keeps people, this is what keeps me here is being able to tell those stories and to understand these people walk among me and I'm privileged to work with these people. So I'll take maybe a different approach to a different kind of story. Um, so I mentioned that, so the, the founder of the foundation that I'm at, Gordon Moore, um, so Gordon's, he's, Gordon's in his 80s, he's still involved in the foundation, he comes back for our board meetings quarterly, and he's this just unassuming guy. And he's one of the six people that started the revolution that is Silicon Valley. And so you meet him and you're just sort of in awe like, wow, you, dude, you are the man. Like You just have this approach when you walk up to him. Um, Gordon tells this story about the first chemistry set he had when he, had, when he was a kid. And how it, it upsets him that if a kid were to be able to get a chemistry set today, it wouldn't have most of the same stuff in it because it's illegal and it's explosive and things that we just don't <laughs> put in chemistry sets anymore. 
so we've, we've been working and we just launched a competition on what would be in the 21st century chemistry set. So we had a real opportunity to tell Gordon's story <coughs> and for the things that he used to do. And it's not necessarily to draw a straight line between inspiring people to be deeply interested in science and therefore work in Silicon Valley, become a you know, lab researcher, but to help people to see the value of science in their everyday life and to ask smart questions and to believe in the importance and the value of science. So hearing him tell that story has inspired lots of other stories as we've launched this competition. We've heard from tons of people who say, I totally remember having potassium in chemistry class and blowing up a sink. And it was great because then I learned this and this and my teacher engaged me in this way. And I still think about it to this day when I either am thinking about basic, you know, sort of consequences for a decision that I make or it's inspired people to think about the chemistry set in a broader way to think about the natural sciences and the role that you know biology plays in our everyday world. So seeing the way that the one has inspired so many other stories and so many other ideas, it's these little sparks of discovery that you watch go off in people's faces and it's, it's been fantastic. I know Ron started with his closing message, but <laughs> I appreciated that, but are, is there anything you guys want to leave, a resounding statement, anything that you guys really think defines what we've talked about today, so we're about out of time? Uh, okay. Uh, I said this earlier, and, and understand that there are a lot of tools out there for you to be a content creator and producer and uh, distributor. Understand what they are, be a master at what they are, and be a master of knowing when to apply it, and how, and with whom. And I think that's the way you're going to tell your best, most important story. And, and understand the underlying research as to why that audience. Don't, don't just shoot from the hip. Really, uh, you know, make an effort. And I would just say, if you want to be a good storyteller, first make sure that you're a really good listener. Because if you're a good listener, people are going to trust you, and they're going to tell you great stuff. I mean, I am honored by the amount of information, the quality of information that people have shared with me over the years, sometimes for very personal situations, for very inspiring situations. And if you're a good listener, you're going to be privy to all of those great stories. So, so be a good listener and, and bring to those, those discussions the compassion that really honors the people that you're talking with. I love these tools, uh, and I'm as connected or addicted to them as, as anybody in your generation. But I'll, I'll go back to my, my opening closing, which is that uh, balance. It's all about balance. And uh, if you can't remember the last time you left this behind for a, an hour a day, then you really need to take a look at that. Uh, we all need to take a look at that. I would also say one thing we didn't talk about is who's the messenger? You know, what's the picture? What's the message? But who the messenger is is so important to how credible your message is. If it's a third party, validating uh, an issue or a product or a service or a, a not-for-profit. It's powerful. We're expected to say good things about ourselves and our organization. When someone else does it, it's got ahas in it. So uh, my last thing would be to, to write a long letter for you that might be 250 <coughs> words to someone you love, longhand, send it, put a stamp on it, snail mail. It will freak them out in a good way and uh, see how long can go without one of these this weekend. Well, I think we should give our amazing panel a round of applause. I wanted to thank everyone for coming today. It's been a great opportunity to moderate this panel and be here. I want to thank the Advisory Council for being here this week and always guiding us and helping us and being there for us through everything. And it's great that we all get this opportunity to work with these amazing professionals. And I hope everyone took away a lot today. I know I did. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You know, I, I learned a lot from you both.